Spirit, will you move? You make my heart proud. Will you fill the room? You're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you feel me. Hallelujah. Lift your hands to Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's go ahead and lift your hands to the Lord this morning. God is a good God, and I pray that you have an open heart this morning. I, I believe that God has prepared a word for us, and I believe that he wants to touch us, heal us, open our eyes, and take us to a whole nother level. I believe that that's what he wants to do today. Today, So just lift your hands and speak to the Lord and let him know that you're ready to receive from him. Just speak to the Lord and say, God, I'm ready to receive this morning. Come on, talk to him just a little bit before the word comes. I say, Lord, speak to me. I, I need to hear you. Uh, hallelujah. Glory to God. Speak to us. Speak to us this morning. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, open your mouths. Open your mouths. Speak to God. Say, speak, Lord, speak. Speak to my heart, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 I praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Praise you. Come on now. Let's put our hands together and receive it. Let's clap in agreement. That we were receiving what the Lord has for us this morning. God's going to speak to us, and, he, and he's going to challenge us this morning. And I, I just pray that your heart is ready for what he wants to do. Amen. Um, this morning, uh, I, I want you to uh, look at, a, at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And when you get there... I want you to scroll down. To verse 13. Hallelujah, chapter 13, verses 13. First Corinthians, we're going to read one verse here. We're going to open up, then I'm allow you to go ahead and be seated. And it says... And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. I want you to think about this for a second. Whenever God positions you for greatness, he always goes back to his greatest command. The Bible says one of his greatest commands was that we love one another. Not only that we love one another, but we love him with all of our heart and all of our soul. The hard part of doing that is that you have to get you out of the way because there are some people that you just don't want to love and God has commanded you to love the unlovable. 
And we have to understand that with all of our heart. So this morning, I want to preach to you on a subject called Position for Greatness. Positioned for Greatness. Go ahead and be seated this morning. I believe that God wants to speak and uh, he's going to You know, one of the greatest commands that you could ever hear from God is when he talks about loving us. When he talks about loving us. You know, because a lot of time people don't think that God loves them. God loves us so much that, you know what, the people that you think love you, um, how could I say this? The people that you think love you, their love doesn't compare to the love that God gives you. Their love doesn't compare. I, I used to think that my mom, I not used to think, but I still think that my mom was, while she was here, that she loved me. Yeah, she loved me. She did everything. She worked two jobs um, so I could fit in with society, and she blessed me with all kinds of things. And then also she, uh, uh, not only did she do that, but she came home from those two jobs and cooked. Come on, talk to me a little bit, right? And I sit there, and sometimes I didn't even want to eat the food. I was so selfish. Come on, talk to me. You know how it is. If there's something that you don't want to eat, if you're a spoiled child, I want to talk to some spoiled people, right? And, and how many know that, you, you know, sometimes the people go to work, they come home, and all of a sudden you, they prepare food for you, and you don't even eat it. And you start thinking about what they did not cook or what they should have cooked, or what they should have done. And I used to do my mom like that. It's like, you know, she she worked all day, and then she came home, washed the dishes, took out the garbage, all of the stuff, and, and I still didn't appreciate what she did. See, now I appreciate it, but it's, she, she's gone. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Every recipe I try to mimic, everything I try to to do uh, also even with my dad it's just things that I try to to mimic and 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 remember and try and do but you know sometimes it's almost too late because it, they're gone and they, they they tried to do their best and different things but you know they're gone and I used to say to myself they you know what I mean they, they I thought that they loved me but I didn't know how deep they loved me but they did all of those things but God himself I said, God himself left the heavenly realms and became the word. He was the word. The Bible says that he was the word and he came and dwelt among us. He left all his royal deity. That means that, and then he came, God himself. This is God. Jesus is God. Can you hear you say amen? He left all of that. And the Bible says in the beginning that, that it was the word. Come on now. The word. And, and, and listen to this. The Bible also says that God was there and Jesus was there. God's spirit was there. Everybody was right there. And, and listen to this. The crazy part about it was that he loved us so much that he left all of that. Streets of gold, the heavenly realm, angels worshiping him. And he left all of that to find you. And when he found you, he died for you. And not only did he die for you, but he, 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 he began to uh, 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 make sacrifices for you. you know, I, I know that we, 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 we do church things, but I want you to realize something here that this is real talk. This is something that happened, and he came down to die for us, and we were living a miserable life before we met Jesus. I don't know about you, but my life was miserable. Then he died for me. Amen. I tried everything to have fun because I wanted so much fun because I thought I wasn't going to need Jesus. I, I need somebody to hear me here. I, I wanted to have so much fun that I thought I wasn't going to need nobody, but after the fun played out and after everything faded away, we found out that we needed Jesus. Jesus after he left come on come on that man that boyfriend that girl that drug came down can you say man that alcohol came down that boo left you hello somebody when you thought we're gonna leave all of a sudden he was the only one that was still there saying that I love you and if I had to do it all over again I would do it again for you 
Come on, talk about Jesus. I'm talking about Jesus. This is the reason why we need to make sure that you're understanding who you worship. Because a lot of times we love everybody, but when it comes down to the one that died for you, my mom didn't die for me. My dad didn't die for me. They paid rent for me. They fed me, but they didn't die for me. And they didn't take my sins away. Whatever I did, was I was stuck with. That's why I worship Jesus. You didn't come to have church this morning. I'm trying to get personal with you so that you'll understand who you worship and you can quit slow dragging and begin to realize who you worship. I worship the Lord and Savior that found me in the alley. Come on, somebody. Found me in the alley and looked out for me. Come on. He cleansed me. He cleansed me. And he took that mindset away. Somebody ought to shout and say he did the same for me. If he had to find you, come on, come on, give the Lord praise. I want 10 people. If he had to go looking for you somewhere and prove his love for you, give him praise. Come on, I, I say give him praise. If he had to find you. There we go. You don't get it. You don't get it. You don't get it. He found me. Then he placed my feet on a solid rock. You know what a solid rock is? Jesus. Became the cornerstone of my life. Nothing could move and nothing could be built on my life without him being the main foundation. Somebody ought to shout about it. I'm just trying to tell you about Jesus. I ain't even got to my notes yet. Because a lot of people don't praise him. They praise him because of what people told them. I praise him for who he is. He left heaven for me. That's a shout right there. I said that's a shout right there. Whether you're young or old, he left heaven to come and get me. Come on, he didn't leave Prospect and he didn't leave Truce and Paseo. He left heaven. I said he left heaven. You don't want to mess with me this morning. Come on, we're going to get it. We're going to get it. Listen, what he did is that he said this. You guys are going to be seated. He said this this morning, and he told me to tell you that the greatest thing that he gave you was these three things. He, he says faith, hope, and love. These are great things. But I want you to understand greatness is often understood by experiences. A lot of times you don't, you don't consider yourself great until you experience something great or get around somebody that's great. They said this about Michael Jordan. They said Michael Jordan was the greatest of all time. But until LeBron showed up, people, you, you got to hear what I'm saying. People start debating his greatness. Can I hear you say amen? They even debated his greatness when Dominique showed up. You don't know about Dominique, do you? You got to be my age. But Dominique, he was a dunker. Uh, and some of you, we go a little bit further back, you find Vince Carter, amazing. Come on. I, 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 I was standing beside Vince Carter one day, and, and I was talking to him, and I called him Dominique. He says, that's the other Skywalker. I was so embarrassed because I, I was so happy to meet the guy, and then all of a sudden when I meet him, I call him the wrong thing. I met a lot of people, celebrities in my time, but they, they all claim to be great. I never met Muhammad Ali, but he said that he was the greatest of all time until Mike Tyson showed up. I, some of you will debate it. Some of you will debate the greatness of Muhammad Ali because he lost and he won and he lost and he won and he lost and he won. Some of you even go to hockey. And you would say Wayne Gretzky was the greatest. That's what they call him, Wayne the Great Gretzky. Until Mario Lemieux showed up in Pittsburgh and they start calling him the greatest. I, I, I want you to idea something. Until you uh, uh, grow up, when you grow up in your neighborhood, you probably thought you were the best looking. Come on, talk to me just a little bit. I said, some of you thought you were the finest or some of you thought you were the most handsome in your neighborhood until you changed zip codes. And the day you changed zip codes, there was somebody else that looked greater. 
There was somebody else to look better. Somebody else had a better house than you. Somebody else had a better whip than you. Come on, talk to me a little bit. And you found out that you weren't as bad or nice looking or driving like you thought you were. But here it is. We stand to tell you that Jesus was the greatest of all time. I said he's the real goat. And when you tell his story, it's still the number one seller in 2,000 years. Nobody has taught his story. When you preach the gospel, people get saved. People get moved. Things happen to people. So we're looking for experience. If you want a great experience, try Jesus. Somebody say try Jesus. Mm. So when you think of that word, Pastor Nick defined, uh, defined it so great last week. He said that it meant mega. We serve a mega God. I said we serve a mega God. Some of you don't believe that. Some of you don't know him like that because you ain't did nothing mega. But I'm here to tell you. I, you know what I mean? God don't take little steps. God is a big stepper. Somebody say a big stepper. He's a deep stepper. He, he, he steps into, when he stepped onto the planet, he changed everything. The Bible says when he stepped down and, and, and the word became flesh, everybody started changing. The Bible says when he resurrected, dead people got out of the grave. That, I'm talking about a story that you can tell that can shake the earth. I'm talking about a story that you can tell that men and women's life would change even if they didn't want to change. But when they hear the truth, something happens when you hear the truth about Jesus and what he has done for us. Get it? It's 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 it's, a, it's something that stirs you on the inside. Yes. Let me teach you this a little bit, just a little bit. I want to make a mention here uh, about last week, real quick. Um, there were some people that was outstanding. I, I want to make mention of because sometimes you know when you're behind the scenes, you don't you don't get uh, people don't mention you. Come on, talk to me a little bit. People don't mention you. I, I just want to make an honorable mention to the men's home. Yeah. The men's home. There's a few of them that work crazy hours. I want to I make mention of them. Uh, Brother Keith, he's around here somewhere. Brother David. He's around here. I don't know where you're at. Wave your hand. And also, Othello Webb, wave your hand. Reason why, and the men's home. The reason why I'm mentioning them, because I don't think we could have pulled off last weekend without the home. Uh, it's something, it, it's like those guys are being trained to be warriors. Listen, I'm telling you, man, the, the guys work like... Probably one week they work 20 hours a week. I, I don't even know if they got any sleep. 20 hours, no, a day. I'm sorry, not a week. Every time they went home after midnight, after midnight, after midnight. And I, I keep saying that I was going to mention them because nobody else was going to mention them if I didn't. But I want to make mention of them because they deserve it. Now, everybody else did work hard. Let me, let me say uh, the church and all of this, you know, the church, you guys really were class act last week and great. Come on, give the Lord praise for that. But if you want to be a great church and a mega church, how many know people have to serve like this to this capacity? We've got to have people that's willing to serve like this. I'm going to teach you something and we're going to go back into our praise and we're going to bring it home. Amen. Now, listen, I, I want you to understand something, people of God, that, that if you want to be a great church or a mega church, it's going to start with people serving like uh, a great serve. A great serve. You can't have a weak serve like Serena. You, Serena's got a strong serve. Come on, talk to me. Serena's got to serve. She got the backhand, pow. She got the front hand, pow. They got it going, right? She, she's got to serve. But when you're serving in, in the body of Christ, I want you to get this. You've got to be strong. You can't be a weak servant. That means show up when you want to, when the people need you. That's a weak servant. You know, folk need you, and, 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 and you show up when you feel like it. That's a weak servant. You're making it into heaven, but listen to this. I don't want to get to my to my holy place or get to my place where I'm going to spend eternity at and then this is how I'm served the way I serve others. Mm -hmm. 
you're in need, they show up for you. The angels show up late. Oh, I just want to be just in the nick of time and let you suffer all the way up until the point that you can't take it no more. <laughs> Come on, talk to me. We need to realize, people, that we're serving God. And I'm trying to teach you something here because if you don't get this right, you're going to go into heaven thinking this way. We did a great job. A great job. Give yourselves a praise clap offering. I was with the founder the other day, and it word it got back to him, and he was like, man, I heard that you had, that guys had a great, great time over there with Sonny Drew. And listen, and, and, and you know the crazy part about it all is this, is that everyone sees the church exploding except for some of us. What we did last week was incredible. You don't see many churches do what we did last week. You know, the most amazing thing about it is that you guys let me take care of the guests, and you guys took care of everything and allowed me to minister to the guests and the guests to minister to us, and we were able to do all of this without me stopping having to babysit. You guys were, listen, I'm telling you that you guys are going mega. Your minds are changing and you're becoming great. But the Bible says this. Listen to this. It's critical right now that you are able to deal with the pain and the issues of your past. It's critical. It's critical that you deal with it so that you don't taint this incredible season that God is trying to bring you into. Right now, God is making this ministry a great ministry, a mega-minded ministry. And I'm not just saying this. This is where we're headed. And I want you to understand something. Everything that, that, that comes into this church is going to have this mindset. That's going to have this mindset. But God wants to remove you from your tainted past and move you into a great and bright future. This is the great thing God's getting ready to do. Somebody said God's getting ready to do something in me. The Bible says this. It says, behold, the former things are going to come to pass. And new things I'm going to do, declares the Lord. Before they spring forth, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. This is what Isaiah says. He says these things that, that you don't understand that's about to happen in your life is going to overtake the theory of the way you think. You're going to say to yourself, how could God do it this way? Because God is the type of God, it seems like he works from upside down. The way you thought he was going to do it, he do not do it that way. He doesn't do it that way. The way you want it done, he doesn't do it that way. He's always the opposite of what we think and how he's going to do it. And God is saying to us, former things we're going to have to get rid of. Old ways and old methods and old ways of how to do things. These things are, he's saying that you got to get rid of it because... He's going to tell us what's going to happen. Now, I believe that he spoke to us last week. I believe that he says that, that this season that we're in, it's, going to, it's, it's, it's over. We're entering into a new season, and he's saying that the former things have passed away. Now, I want you to understand, you're not who you used to be. Come on, I want you to understand that. You, you, you guys are not who you used to be. Ben, you're not who you used to be. I know the people look at you. It's a new anointing is about to come upon this team, upon this church, and we're going to go to a whole nother. Come on. It, it's something big is about to happen. I, I, I can see it in, my, in, in the vision that God has given me. Something great is about to happen. I, 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 I'm here to tell you God is saying to us we're about to move into another season. That 25 represents the end of an old and coming into a whole new era. I don't know about you, but I can feel a whole new setting, something happening. 
Ever since the day God said that, 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 that he was going to do this new thing over this weekend, listen to this. This has been a promise that he gave us 25 years ago. But now all of a sudden he says it starts right now. What am I saying? I can't turn a corner without God showing me a building. I can't go any place without God showing me a bank. I can't look. I, I can't. I, I, I'm stirred. I'm, I'm here to tell you. I'm stirred. I, and I'm telling you something, people. Don't wait till it happened. Don't wait till it happened. That's what. That's what the right one of the one of the uh, 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 characters in the Bible says that. Don't wait till it happened. Shout now. I couldn't think of his name right now. But but he says, don't wait till the battle is over. You got to learn how to do it right now because a lot of people want to wait till they get it to shout. I don't want to wait. I'm in position. Come on, talk to me. As we get in position to do what God has called us to do, I want you to understand one thing. Shout while you're in position. Thank God that you were able to get there. You know what I'm thanking God for? We're getting ready to choose. I prophesy. This time next year, I said this time next year, we're going to be in our own, another facility, a campus. God is positioned. I want somebody to stand and say, I'm getting ready. Come on, come on, come on. You got to stand up like a champion and say, I'm getting ready. I'm getting my mind ready. I'm getting my heart ready. I'm entering into a new season. Touch your name and say, I'm going in a new season. I'm going to give you some good news. If God's going to bless the church, who do you think the church is? I ain't the church. I'm the pastor. Come on. I'm going to get a little crazy with you. You're the church. Somebody say, you're the church. God's about to bless you. Jobs, increase, businesses are coming to our ministry. We've been praying long enough. We've been on a lot more long enough dealing with food stamps, walking into places that we can't even buy nothing to eat, working in places that won't even serve us. God is saying to you, it's still time. You ain't hear what I'm saying. Hold it, hold it. We ain't having church. We are the church. I want you to get that through your mind. God is about to bring increase to your house. How are we going to build a church without you? So God's going to go through you and bless you. Then he blesses his house. You guys clap too soft. You, I ain't trying to get you hype. The word became flesh. And he came down and dwelt among us. He says that I'm about to do a new thing inside of your life. You don't understand it right now, but you're about to enter into a new season. Go speak, be seated right quick, right quick. I got to show you this because sometimes you, you people don't listen. You don't listen. There's three seasons you're about to enter in. Somebody say three. three. You're about to enter in three different seasons of your life. And listen to this. And the reason why you're going to enter it in because you ain't got no choice if you're going to serve God. He's going to give you Three different kinds of seasons. One of the seasons is going to be a season of development. God's going to develop you. He's developing your faith. He's getting you ready. All that late stuff and all of that church stuff, God's going to give you a song in your heart where you're going to dance to all by yourself. Come on, all by yourself. He's going to give you a song that you're going to be able to dance to. You're going to be able to worship, and it's going to break you because you're going to think of the goodness of God. He's going to develop you. Somebody say develop you. God gave me a song. I was sitting on the back of a truck, unloading the truck at Dillard's when I first got saved. And God began to sing to me and minister to me. And, and, and I had a song deep down on the inside of me. And that song began to develop me. I started being nice to people. I started shaking hands. I started giving people hugs and Pentecostal handshakes. I started paying my tithes. Why? Because God was developing me. I wasn't a hater. I wasn't a jealous person no longer. I didn't sit around and criticize what others was doing. I, I, I began to grow. Me and my wife both said, what can we do to help the church not what the church could do to help us 
What can we do to stir this gate? Get this church on fire there in Chicago. And God says, one day I'm going to give you a church of your own. How many know if you take care of somebody else's vision? God will send them, listen to this, God will give you your own vision. Come on, talk to me, church. A lot of times people don't like to take care of what belongs to other people. One day, God's going to look and say, you were faithful in the little. And now, come on, enter into the rest. Come on, somebody. I got a whole lot more for you because I'm positioning you, come on, for greatness. You can't be great if I don't make you great. God's got to make you great. God made Abraham great. He says, I'm going to make your name great. But there were some things that Abraham had to do. He had to make sacrifices. He had, come on, he had to give up his only begotten son. Don't that sound like a move God made? You ain't ready for church. You ain't ready for church. You saying, come on, come on, come on. I want you to come on. Come on, I want you to come on. I'm tired of the church saying, come on, preacher. Come on, preacher. Come on, preacher. Come on, I want the church to come on. I want you to come on because we're stuck because of you and your come ons. Get up and do something great for God. Greatness is on you. Somebody say greatness is on you. I'm being developed. Greatness is on you, but I'm being developed for greatness. That's the first season. Sex season the, the next season is a season of disclosure. Get this. You know, you know what disclosure is? The secret things about a product. The secret things about a product. They'll tell you to take some medication, then they say, oh, you could die from this. And, and this, that. You know, you know that little small print at the bottom? Whenever you think of disclosure, God says that you're not going to be a secret any longer. <sighs> Victory Outreach, we're not a secret any longer. People know who we are. That's why we got to get a good place of worship. We can't be on the boulevard. We can't be hanging out where all of these other folks are at. We can come and get them and bring them to where we're going to be, but we can't. We, we no longer, this neighborhood and us don't get along no more. There's something God is shaking. Yeah, we got never lose the heart for the drug addict, the prostitute, and the, the down and out. We'll never lose heart for them because that's who we are. But God is saying that it's time for us to expand. There's nothing in this place that we can buy that can take us to the level where God wants us to. So our mind has got to make this develop this area into a place where God's spirit can dwell and his greatness can be told. So here it is when God's developing us and then God brings us to a place of disclosure. That means that we're no longer a secret. People know who you are. That's why people are walking around talking about, you don't look the same no more. You don't act the same no more. Come on, come on. You, anybody ever told you, you look different? Come on, talk. since you start going to church, they didn't ask you that when you went to the club. But since you've been going to church, they say, it's something about you. That's the God in me. Come on, somebody. Somebody, you better, you better shout about it. You're looking at the God that's in me. You ain't looking at the old me because the old me would have told you something. But the new me, come on. I said the new me is searching for greatness. Tell your neighbor, I'm not a secret no more. Come on, somebody say, I'm not a secret no more. See, you're entering a season of disclosure. What well, greatness is on you. You don't get it. I said, it's on you. Like you got deodorant on. Greatness is on you. Come on, talk to me. I said, greatness is on you. You got on deodorant this morning? You got to know that you got greatness on you. And you got to be sure. Is anybody sure this morning that greatness is on you? I'm sure that greatness is on me. Come on, come on. Somebody need to help me preach this in here. Greatness is on you, and I'm here this morning to tell you that you're positioned for greatness because it's all over you. They can no longer keep you a secret victory outreach. It's your coming out season. 
downtown Marriott says, who are those people? And we said, Victory Outreach, we'll show you how we do it. And we came up in there and rocked the whole hotel. I'm here to tell you, people were pulling up and paying, and listen to this, we ain't never paying for parking. I saw all you people coming there paying $25, $30 for parking. I said, look at Victory Outreach, showing out. How did they show up? They came like never before. God says, it's your season. You're no longer a secret to his people. Come on, come on. I dare you to put yourself through one of these. I'm no longer a secret. Come on. I'm no longer a secret. They used to hide me before, but I'm no longer a secret. Because every time I move, God moves. I said, every time he moves, Come on, you got to understand that. Here's the third one. A season of delivery. Because you're, 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 you're right, now, some of you, greatness is on you, but you're in a season of being delivered. I know you don't want to hear it, but that's where you're at. This is how greatness comes. Greatness doesn't have four seasons. It has three seasons. And you're in a season of deliverance. Some of you still cuss. But you love the Lord. Come on, come on. Some of you still watching crazy movies, but you still love God. Come on, come on. Some of you still messing around, sleeping around, but you love God. You love God. You don't want to do it permanent, but you just tried it one more time. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Talk to me a little bit. I know you don't want to clap because that may be you. You, you just tried it one more time. You say, I, I, I'm going to try. My flesh is killing me. My flesh, my flesh, my flesh. The Bible says that we need to walk in the spirit so that we don't fulfill the lust of our flesh. But when greatness comes upon you, God's got to bring deliverance. It's called sanctification. And you're going to go through a process where it seems like your flesh is winning. But no, you're just becoming great. And there's some things that he's going to allow you to keep doing until you get tired of being misused and stepped on and talked about. Come on, somebody. Ain't nothing wrong with being a virgin. Come on, talk to me. Ain't nothing wrong with being a virgin. Ain't nothing wrong. I'm, I'm trying to help somebody in here. There's nothing wrong with being a virgin. At least that person that's a virgin, they don't have memories of what they used to do. Don't let nobody talk about you because you ain't into that stuff. Don't let nobody put you down because the Bible says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's why God's got to deliver us, save us, pull us out, get our mind, because he knows where we are. You can be a cheap one, you can be an easy one, you can be a high price, but they're all st It's all the same ones. A hooker is a hooker. Come on, somebody. Come on. You don't want to hear it. God's got to deliver us. A drug user is a drug user. Come on, you smoking weed, you got tattoos all over your neck and your back. You got to understand when God brings you to a place of deliverance, he's doing it for the house. Not just for you. I know you don't want to clap for it, I say. Don't put that one on tape because that thing will go viral. I call people hookers. Yeah, God deliver hookers because his great-great-grandmama was a You don't get it, you don't get it, you don't get it. Rahab was a hooker, a high praise hooker. And what it was is that Jesus was, that was his great, 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 great. So Jesus understands who he's delivering. Because sometimes he's got to get you four and five generations back to get you delivered. I ain't talking about Jesus. I'm talking about some of you who are being stuck up and you don't want to become greatness, but it's already on you. Rahab didn't understand that greatness was on her when those men came and approached her. They didn't improve. Listen to this. They didn't come to somebody that didn't want to be great. They came to somebody that said, you know what? Since you helped me out, I'm going to help you out. And soon as she did that, her name became what? Great. And now she's in the Hall of Fame. Come on, somebody. The Hall of Fame of Faith. What does God want to do with our church? He'll take your testimony and make you great. You ain't all that. Don't quit, quit tripping because you ain't got those, like you ain't a, a drug addict and you're not a prostitute. But if you haven't done right by God, you're somebody that he had to deliver. There's three seasons that he's in. He's, he's going to bring you out. You're not going to be a secret. Rahab was not a secret anymore. She didn't have to hide men in her house no more. 
when God brought her out, it became her testimony. And she saved a whole lot of people. Come on, I said her whole family was saved. Everybody knew I was a prostitute, but she became what? You're going to become great. People know you for who you are. Been stubborn in the church, coming to church late, not giving and doing all of these things. But greatness is upon you. If you have joined this church, God is saying to you, I'm going to make you great. I'm going to make your name great. You're going to go to work. Come on. And, and all of a sudden, great things are going to happen to you at your job. You're going to get promotions and all those things. Because why? I want to do great things for this church. Clap if you believe that. Okay, I'm going to move to the next point. Listen, what position the great? Now, what does this mean? Paul said it like this. Philippians chapter 3, 13 and 14 says this. Brother, I do not count myself to have apprehended. But one thing I do is forgetting the things which are behind me and reaching forward to the things which are before me. I press towards the mark of the higher calling. I, I, I need you to listen right here, people. Paul said, I forget the things that are behind me. He says, and I press towards the mark. Pressing is what we get the word pressure from. Hmm, this is going to mess you up. Now, 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 this is what we get the word pressure from. Now, Paul is saying that, that he had to add pressure to what was in opposition of him. What was holding him back from obtaining his goal? Whenever you receive a promise from God, there's going to always be resistance. Resistance is going to be this, the things that keeps you from reaching your goal. There's going to be something when you dream of something, there's going to always be something in the middle of you accomplishing it. If you dreamed it, or if you drift, I'll put it like this. I want, I want to make it elementary. Can I do that? It's like if you could get what you wanted, you would just go to it. It would be that simple. You see it, you just go and get it. It's like something you pay for. But when God promises you something, there's something in between. Listen to this. The devil is going to always bring resistance. Resistance is like this. You have those three seasons operating in your life. But there's going to always be something that tries to stop you from becoming who God wants you to be. Now, hold on, hold on for a second. The reason why I'm saying this, I want you to take just five seconds. You know what it is. But look at that thing that's stopping you from becoming who God wants you to be. Some of you don't even know what it is. Otherwise, you would just become it. You would just do it. But it's always something that stands in between the, the promise, you and God. It's called resistance. Now, Paul said, I press. Stay with me here. The reason why he was pressing is because he had to press against that what's, what? Trying to be stronger than him, the resistance. So whenever there's like, it's like a, it's like a rubber band or something that, that's like you press and it's something holding you back. God uses the illustration of an eagle because he says this. If a church is going to grow, it needs strength. And he says this. He says that you should mount up wings like an eagle. This is what Isaiah writes. He said you should mount up wings like an eagle. Because the reason why an eagle, when he mounts up, he, he does something different than a lot of people. He flies different. He acts different. So when you look at an eagle, he always, he does something different like an airplane. Imagine our airplane. This is how airplane goes up. I'm almost there. I'm almost at my point here. I said all of this to get to one point. The airplane goes up in the air. It just don't fly. You know what the airplane does? It flies into the resistance. And the pressure from the plane goes right into the pockets of resistance. And the resistance take it higher. Paul said, I press because of the simple fact is that I know that resistance coming, but I got to be stronger than die. 
So I press on towards my goal. What is my goal? My promise that God has given us. It's got to be a pressing because if there's no pressing, resistance would take over. You ain't hearing what I'm saying here. That means the things that stopping you from getting from your promise would also overtake you. Now, eagles flock by themselves. But an eagle knows how to stir up those were born of him or her. Now, an eagle places his child in the little nest that he has, and, but he leaves out points. The points, it, is, it, it just seems a little cruel because the eagle, when he leaves his eaglet in, in the nest, he leaves sharp points. So as the eagle grows up, he gets uncomfortable because the eagle knows either you're going to fly or you're going to die. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw you out and let you understand what resistance is. I'm going to throw you out of the nest and I'm going to hope that you're going to fly because you was born to fly. You weren't born to sit in a nest. So I've got to make the nest uncomfortable. They call this that the eagle is stirring up his eaglets. That's what I'm trying to do to you. I'm trying to make you uncomfortable. You, you, you don't want to be uncomfortable. Some people don't like to be uncomfortable. They like the air conditioning at a certain temperature. I, 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 need, I need space in my seat. I need all of this. For what? And the reason why I'm saying for what is because I can see if you're going to get up and do something great. Because you are great. I said you are great. Come on, point to yourself. I give you. I, come on. I, you are great. Come on, say, I am a great woman or a great man of God. Now, now get this. If you're great, why don't you fly? I'm tired of sitting in the nest. I'm uncomfortable. People come to us and say, that place where you're at is too small. People come to us, the place where you are is too small. You've outgrown that place. You've outgrown that mindset. You do things bigger. Do you see how we acted in a bigger facility? You, you got to understand, it was something on you that you don't put on to come in this room. God is saying to you that, that I want to move you to another season. Don't resist it. You got to thank God for the pressure. Welcome the pressure. Because what will pressure do? Take you higher. Come on, somebody say, take me higher. That's what pressure will do. Take me higher. Somebody say it again. Take me higher. That's what pressure does. So you need to go back to your job. Come on, brother. We're going to close it out. Listen to this. You, you need to go back to your job and thank every hater for all of those people that put pressure on your life. Come on, you need to go back to your jobs and go back to your communities and say, I thank you for the pressure. I thank you for making me uncomfortable, Pastor Dan, because if I would have sat here for another year, I probably would have died in the fight. Come on, somebody. I can't sit still. I've got to do something. I'm in position. I'm in position to do something. I've got to get raised up. God is calling my name. I am a great man and a great woman of God. He's calling me to greatness. I'm in position the greatness for greatness what is it that you want from God tell him and he'll see you through it somebody say he'll see you through it Paul said it like this he says this I'll scratch for the things that are ahead what are you scratching for everybody's in scratch mode I said everybody's in scratch mode I'm about to bring it home. I'm just telling you, it's over. Everybody's in stretch mode. When you eat too much, guess what? What are you stretching for? Some of you work two jobs. You're stretching to have what you have. What are you stretching for? Everybody's stretching, but what are you stretching for? 
What are you stretching yourself for? Greatness for your own personal life instead of for what God wants you to have greatness for? So in a sense, Paul was saying, as I'm pressing, I see the, I see the, uh, uh, the resistance, but I'm not afraid of the resistance because it's making me stronger. What did God tell uh, Joshua to be strong? Why? Because you always need strength when you're going to the next level. We're not strong enough to do what God has called us to do. We ain't strong enough, man. We ain't strong enough to do what God wants us to do. I'm going to tell you again. You notice how your mindset changed when we went into that building over there on 12th Street. You put on a mega mind. You start singing like it was a mega service. I saw, I saw, I saw, I saw things that I never saw certain people do before. You was acting like a big boy and a big girl. You was so you were serving, you were talking, you had class, you had dignity, you were, you was you was you, you was all that. But something happened that I I, I want to share, and this is the end of this thing here. You know. When God did all of those things, he showed us what he wanted to do. And he says that, that, that we're going to become great in all of these things. This is what's about to happen. But one thing I, I want to I leave with you, after you've scratched for yourself, will you scratch for God? Come on, you see how slow you're clapping? That's resistance between you and God. You can't even clap because resistance got your hands. It's like, don't give God praise like that because you do that, then you're going to have to commit to what he's saying. Come on. Somebody say pressure. Pressure, pressure busts pipes, but pr pressure also builds character. Amen. Listen. You remember, uh, listen to this. You remember in the scripture it says that you won't notice it, but it will spring up. Right? It'll spring up. The Bible says, and this promise that he's given us, he says that it's going to spring up. He says, you don't notice it? It's about to take place. I want you to look and tell yourself, it's springtime. You know what I mean by springtime? You remember that toy they used to call Jack in the Box? They would say, right? But Jack stayed in the box. He stayed in the box in a dark place, confined. Confined. And why did he stay in the box? Because there was no pressure added to his life. There was nothing to bring Jack out of the box. So the toy was designed when pressure was added. The resistance that held it down. All of a sudden, when you start cranking that thing, before you know it, old Jack said, okay. You never know that when Jack came out of the box, Jack was never angry. You know why he wasn't angry? He was in a dark place. That would have been me and said, you had me in there all these years until somebody came and cranked. No, no, no. Jack came out. Excited. You know why? Because he knew the sooner somebody put their hands on the box, something was about to happen. What I'm saying to you is this. Soon as they add pressure, something, welcome the pressure. Because when pressure overcomes the resistance, you go higher. And as you go higher, get this. Old Jack came out of the box. What made him spring up? The pressure. Jack came out. No more being confined. No more being controlled by a box. See, you sometimes you box yourself in. And I got to preach to you every morning and crank you up and stir you up. For you to spring out of that box. You're living in darkness. Not in promise. Some of you living in darkness, not in promise. Because when you live in promise, you walk in victory. You walk in victory. And what I mean by walking in victory, I'm not trying to talk about anybody. But if God says that greatness is on you, 
welcome the pressure. Paul said, it's not that I have obtained anything, but one thing that I do, I press. That's where we get our word pressure from. I, re I receive the pressure because the pressure is going to take me higher. You know what? You know what I have on me? Pressure. So you ain't got the pressure that I got. We've been talking about building a mega ministry, a mega service, mega people. You ain't got the pressure that God. I'm trying to believe God for $2 million for you. Not one, but two. And everywhere I go, God won't let me settle. I was minding my own business the other day. I walk, I come upon the campus. I put it in my phone. I was going to show it. I said, no, they ain't ready for that. They're not ready for it because of the simple fact is that when you're ready for something, your giving shows it. It's like when you're ready for a house, you pay your rent. Can I walk this aisle and talk to you a little bit? I say, when you're ready for a house, you pay your rent where you're at. Because you know that's going to qualify you for the next level of living. When a church is ready to go to another level, listen to this. They pay their tithes. They give. They pay pledges. They pay tithes. Whatever it takes to get to that next level. Because they understand the greatness and the protection of God. They listen to when the guy is ministering, talking about giving. We can't, listen to this, we can't go to another level, listen to this, paying bills like we pay in this building. Stay with me here. I know it get quiet when you talk about money in the church, especially around black folk. Black folk got a problem with preacher talking about money. But I'm here to tell you, if you're cool with staying here or you want your children, children to be excited about what, what they're about to do, I'm going to tell you something, people. We can't tithe here like we're going to tithe at another place. You got to tithe like you're already there. And that means be consistent. It's not like you got to go get another job. Be consistent with your attendance, your giving, your worship. Be consistent with your greatness. It's on you. You are great. But if you don't believe it, you're going to operate the way you used to be. And you're going to let your situation of your past overtake, which is your past, overtake your future. And you'll never be who God wants you to be. You'll grow old. You'll be my age or even older, wondering what you could have been. And that's all you had to be was consistent. That's all I've done. I'm going to let the secret out. All I ever did was be consistent. Whatever job I had, I just gave my tithe. I gave our pledges when we were going to the new building there in Chicago. I gave my tithe. You know, one, I even went beyond that. You know, I went to my 401k plan that me and my wife had before we came. To, uh, we was already here in Missouri. And I sold $10,000 to... Uh, the church, a building fund there in Chicago. I never forget it. I went and I did it. I never gave a, a check that big before. And so when you hear me talking about things like that, I've, I've given over fifteen thousand before. I've given twenty thousand before. It doesn't bother me. Listen to this: to give to God. I don't listen to this. I know God like that. And if you don't know God like that, you better get to know Him like that. Because you're going to always be dependent on your boss to give it to you. Some of you ain't receiving this. I said, your boss ain't God. I'm going to say it one more time. Your boss ain't God. I don't care what color he is, how many extra overtime he's given you, or whatever they've done for you at that company. Because once your season is done there, they're going to put you out of there and give you a pink slip and give you a box to put your stuff in, and you go. But when God is your source, you better get this. I'm telling you, because some of you don't receive, God's got to come down to you and tell you, but he can't tell you nothing because you don't talk to him enough.
God wants you to know greatness is on you. God can't tell you you're great if you don't talk to him. How do you know you're great? God's got to send somebody, a mouthpiece to you and say, Larry, you're a great man. Greatness is on you. He, he would have to send somebody if you don't talk to him. Then when he sends people, you don't want to hear him. So what am I saying? Well, God is saying to you this. Stop telling him how many trees are in your way. God will make a way. Don't tell him about the trees. Tell him what you have. Because you're in position for greatness. That means if you take what you have, it's more than enough. He's not asking you to go get some more and then you become great. He says, take the skittles that you have. It's good enough. Not only that, people of God, I want you to understand this. God will meet you where, where you are. But you got to stay hungry. You ever been around some people that while you were eating, they didn't want nothing to eat? Don't that make you uncomfortable? I hate going to dinner with people that don't eat. Why did you go to dinner with me? Here we go. Why would you come to church with me if you ain't hungry? If you're hungry, eat. Keep people around you that's hungry. Every eye closed. Keep people around you that's hungry. I don't want salad. I want a four-course meal. I want a challenge. Stir me up. Make me uncomfortable. Push me. Shove me. But don't let me stay the same. I welcome the pressure. The resistance is going to make me stronger. That's why I'm pressing on towards my goal. What is my goal? It should be what the church goal is. What, whatever the church is doing, I should want to do also. Position for greatness. Here we go. I want you to stand on your feet. Thank you, church. Thank you for allow me to be your pastor. Thank you for allowing me to challenge you. Thank you for allowing me to speak over your life. Thank you. Listen, I'm going to say this again. Because I don't think you really heard me. I think you just... Thank you. You have the body of Christ here in Kansas City, and I just want to say thank you for receiving me and my family, for taking care of us, for loving us, being here with us, growing with us. Because I remember that first generation had to grow with me. They had to grow with me because I was only saved two years. God put greatness on me years ago and he was saying that you're going to do great things but the problem is is that I don't want you to be the only one in there talking about greatness I want the whole church to feel this way it's springtime do you not perceive it I'm just trying to crank you up I'm trying to crank you up. You've been in that place too long. It's a dark place. You need somebody to push you. You need somebody to push you. 
Tell your neighbor, I'm that jack in the box. It's springtime. Come on, say it's springtime. You believe it's springtime? I want you to get out of your seats. Make your way to the altar. It's springtime. It's time for you to, to bounce back. All the difficulties and all the pressures of life and all the stuff that's worn you down. It's springtime. It's time for you to get it this time. It's time for you to get it. We need men and women right now. Listen, we need men and women not right now that really wants God. That when they lay hands on people, sickness and disease will leave. We need men and women right now that people don't have to wait to see the pastor in order to get a breakthrough. We need men and women right now that can teach and preach this gospel on the street corners, in the high schools, through dramas, through singing. We need men and women right now, listen to this, that can minister to drug-addicted families and the family life turn around. We need men and women right now that can minister to young adults. I'm almost 60 years old. It's hard for me to preach to young people. I got to dress down. I got to put on gym shoes, skinny jeans, and all of that stuff just for them to hear me. But some of you, you just got to show up. Some of you, that's all you got to do is show up. Greatness is on you. You can do it in Spanish. You can do it in English. You can do it in whatever way you want to do it. But this is a great church. It's always been a great church. Anytime, listen, anytime God would take a kid out of Chicago that's only 28 years old to start a ministry, get this, to start a ministry with two years experience. And he lasts for 25 years. He and his wife he had two wives, just one wife. It's a great ministry. If we stick together, we're going to build a mega church. But the problem is, is that when you live in the residue of your past, or you live in the future. Because your future is much brighter than your past. You ain't going to get no brightness from your past. But you can get it from your future. And each one of you can help us if you decided in your heart that you knew you were positioned for greatness. You wouldn't build to fall. You wouldn't build to, 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 to mess up your life after teenage pregnancy and all of this stuff. My wife was a teenage pregnancy. They said she was never going to make it. They said she was never supposed to make it. Nobody supported her. She had to get on a bus with our children. God, me, I end up on drugs. Everything she tried, messed up. But greatness was on her. Even though she was on the bus. She says, if you stick with it, you ain't going to have to ride the bus no more. You stick with it. Only thing I'm telling you to do is stick with it. Stick with the plan that God has given us. Watch and see. You know, my pastor said last week, I got to give you this. He says this was the greatest experience of God that he knew was real in his whole entire life. Outside of what God had did for him. He sat there and he weeped and he weeped and he weeped. Because when they sent us out, they know that's all we had is a few Bible classes and God. I'm going to tell you something. Resistance 
and the pressure makes you stronger, makes you a candidate for miracles. Only thing I'm asking you to do, get in position. Pay your tithes. Read your Bible and pray. Get on that prayer line. Men, where you at? Join up for mighty men of valor. Listen, we're trying to build something. We can't help nobody if we ain't helping ourselves. I'm tired of looking at other churches and going to other places, and you see these people doing stuff, and these folks look just like us. What did they do different than we haven't done? You know what they did? Committed. They committed themselves to the work of the Lord. Because God's going to ask us that one day. Why you didn't help them? Why you didn't do this and why you didn't do that? He's going to ask us. Lift your hands. Greatness is all over you. It's all over our gang. It's all over women in ministry. It's all over our church. But we got to get out of this building to see how great you can become. That's what he did with Abraham. He took him outside of the place where he was at. And that's what God did for us last weekend. And he showed you. He showed you. There we go. Just play something. Whatever the Lord leads you. Because you are great. You do miracles so great. I know it's hard. There is no one else like you. And nobody never saw you explain to you. There is no one else who you like can be. You. They talked about you in school. You are great. They talked about you, you in relationships. So great. In the neighborhood, they talked about there you. Is no one in your family, like they gossip about you. you. Saying that you ain't gonna make it. You are great. But this is what the Lord says. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. Lift your hands. It's all right. 